Welcome to the Pearson Center Change Conference. This is day six of a thought-provoking three weeks of webinars. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm president of the Pearson Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening where we will have five chats with two important Canadian leaders, Hassan Youssef and Annamie Paul. As you may know, the, the, the Pearson Center is a leading progressive think tank that engages with representatives from all five political parties, top business and labor leaders, two of whom we're speaking with today, and many other NGOs and experts in various fields. We like to say that we bring people and ideas together to arrive at good public policy solutions and initiatives. The focus of our change conference is simple. With everything changing so fast, how do we plan for the long term? I want to take a moment to recognize that the Pearson Center is headquartered on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples, and our panel and, and audience are come to us from across Turtle Island. I also want to thank our invaluable sponsors. The platinum sponsor is Bruce Power. Our gold sponsors are CN and Hill Times, along with a special thank you to our longstanding sponsors, uh, sustaining sponsors who include Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, and AMAPSIO, Ontario's provincial employees. The format of our session is that we have a, a two half hour conversations um, and we will end promptly at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Let me introduce our first guest briefly. Hassan Youssef has been president of the Canadian Labour Congress for, for the last seven years. Having started his career as a heavy truck mechanic, he's been active in labour unions throughout his career, uh, being repeatedly elected by his peers to roles such as plant chairman and staff representative. He has been on the CLC executive for over 20 years. His record as president of the CLC is marked by a series of successful campaigns for major changes in federal government policies, which we will discuss in a few moments. At 7.30, we will be talking to Anna Paul, leader of the Green Party of Canada, who we will introduce at that time. Um, I just want to introduce my, my co-moderator as well uh, this evening. She is Dr. Karen Mock a Pearson Center board member. She is a human rights and anti-racism specialist who's been executive director of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and is presently president of JSpace Canada, a progressive Jewish organization. And with that, I'll get started with a few questions for Hassan and then, which will be on some fairly specific issues. And then Karen Mock will um, we'll discuss some broader issues and, and, and uh, give us a chance for you to reflect on your, on your time as president. Uh, so Hassan, I want to I go through uh, four or five key issues where I think you have really uh, raised the bar. Uh, you and the CLC have, have run major campaigns and changed government policy. Um, so, I, so let me go through a, a few of these. Um, and, and I want you to talk about how you went, about why and how you went about them. So let me start with expanding the CPP. Tell us about uh, your role in that. Uh, the CPP was a long, uh, very long campaign, probably the longest in the Canadian history, uh, CLC history. It started actually as a result of the 2008 uh, huge recession that we were in. We recognize, of course, you in that recession, the incredible impact uh, on workers' pension, and more importantly, of course, the challenge that we will face as a country. And we grow workers' uh, participation in private pension, and more importantly, we, if we didn't improve the public pension, uh, we are going to face some serious challenges in the near future as more and more workers, of course, get to retirement. If they don't have enough income in their retirement, it means that they'll be living in poverty, and both government and other uh, structures are going to have to take care of them. So we started the campaign basically to say we need to do this. Of course, what we recognize from the from the get-go is the, the change, of course, uh, improved the CPP. You had to meet two objectives. You have to have 66 and two-thirds of the provinces supporting any improvement to the Canada Pension Plan. And secondly, it also have to represent 66 and two thirds of the population of Canada. If you never have the two equations, you can never, of course, amend the Canada Pension Plan to make improvements. And knowing that reality, we recognize, first of all, let's start with our own members. How do they view expanding the CPP? We certainly had some challenges to overcome. Our members was not enthusiastic because 80% of them belong to a workplace pension to a large extent. They were covered. 
we had to, of course, explain and educate our members and engage them in a conversation why they need to support the expansion of public pension. Because if the broader public does not have a decent pension, why would they support union members having a decent pension was our analysis. And secondly, of course, it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do for the future of the country, but it's also the right thing to do for people who no choice of their own, sorry, no fault of their own, did not have a private pension plan. So we had to build public support for that campaign. We also had to build uh, media support and we had to build political support. It took us a long time, but we were determined. We spent over $20 million in the campaign, our own money, but we also were determined we were gonna win this fight and we we're gonna stay with it until we actually won. The effort, of course, came to uh, fruition in 2016 with the election of um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He made a commitment during his campaign, as did the NDP in that 2015 election. And the minute the election was over, uh, right after the first budget, um, you know, the government said, OK, we're prepared to move forward and expand the can of pension. Roll up your sleeves and let's get this done. Now, we already had the public support for it. We had the political support for it. but. We didn't have a federal government at the time previously that were committed to make that happen. The end result, what we saw was an increase, of course, the first time in the history of the Canada pension was over 50 years, uh, over a 30 something percent increase in the Canada pension uh, for all Canadians. And then for those who are higher income also got an additional uh, increase because they were paying a higher premium at the end of the day. I think in retrospect, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, people will reflect for the younger generation who unfortunately are not getting access to workplace pension, it will give them a better retirement. And more importantly, there's a recognition among those young people. This is for savings, no question what it is, but ultimately what it will do is ensuring that Canadians who retire in the near future are gonna retire in dignity as opposed to retiring in poverty. And I'm very honored to have been part of that work. My staff and my colleagues at the CLC work extremely hard and all the activists and others that supported us, I want to say thank you, but also want to say thank you to all the finance ministers. Many of them, by the way, not a single one of them had been there at the end of the campaign, even when we start the campaign, those who actually supported, this was a good idea, maybe we should get there. It took us that long to get it done, but equally, I think this was a good public policy decision on behalf of Canadians, and I'm very, very honored to have been part of it. Yeah, and, and how did you get the provinces on, on side? Did you then have to lobby each one of them? We lobbied each one of them. We went. I went to every meeting that, that the finance minister had from the first meeting that took place actually in Yukon uh, in the dead of winter. I had a choice going to Copenhagen or going to Yukon. I went to the Yukon, but it was the right <laughs> thing to do. Jim Flaherty was then the finance minister, and there was a little bit of a breakthrough, not a complete breakthrough. They said, well, maybe you got a point here. We should consider this idea. It took many, many years. I could name all of the ministers who were very uh, engaged in the campaign who were not there, but I want to thank uh, a good friend of mine who was there at the end, uh, who stood with us as a guy named Wes Sheridan, who was a finance minister, PEI. He was a strong supporter, but he also turned out to be a good friend of mine. I'm honored to have had the opportunity to work. I also want to thank uh, Bill Morneau for his leadership and Kathleen Wynne as the Premier of Ontario. Both of them played a very significant role in a part of that doing that campaign, as many others, of course, finance ministers at the time who supported us on the campaign. Yeah, and I guess Kathleen Wynne sort of got the ball rolling at the at the provincial level and kind of forced the issue a bit. Yeah, she had, of course, uh, when she became premier and, and, and won, of course, her re-election uh, when she went, went out of campaign, she campaigned on, on actually putting forward an Ontario pension plan if the federal government was not going to move forward and expand on the Canada pension plan. It pains me to do it, and I had to go and see her to tell her she had to park her campaign or commitment for a while and give us a chance to see if we will succeed at a federal level. And to her credit, she did take the risk. We did do the right thing, but I also want to thank her for championing the fact that you know she were committed to supporting us going forward. There's so many people I could thank. I don't want to uh, lose sight of the fact of all the people, but it was important for those who played an important role to acknowledge our responsibility in that. Okay, a few other issues, and I'll try not to ask you questions because it's, it's fascinating, every, all the different parts that, that you got uh, moving because they really all have to work together to, to make such a major change. Um, banning asbestos. Um, I, you I worked with asbestos as a youth. Uh, I worked in General Motors. I was exposed to asbestos and I was very much understood it could still impact my life uh, and, and I could die of the disease because it's a latent 
uh, period in which the disease manifests itself in the in, in, in the body. Um, of course, we didn't have a prime minister until the prime minister Justin Trudeau got elected, who believed in the science. The science was always clear that asbestos was a carcinogen, and if you were exposed to it, one fiber could kill you. So we started this campaign, um, you know, at, at a time when we recognized that the government needed to do something to to ban this substance. We were also exporting asbestos as a country. I, it was mine in Quebec, and we were exporting to other parts of the world without any appreciation of the fact this was going to kill people. We were also importing products in our country. And the campaign, of course, was one of the shortest one in the, in the Congress, in a sense, I think it was about a year and a half. Um, we um, launched the campaign, and of course, there were so many stories that I heard. And I remember very much one of the person that was very much touched by us launching this campaign because he was in the latent stage of the disease he was struggling with. And one of his last dying wish was that he, his wish was for his country to ban the use of asbestos, both import and export, his last dying wish. He didn't live long enough to see his wish, but when we did achieve the ban, was the ministers announced it on December the 15th of 2016. I remember it because it was my birthday. And I normally don't work on my birthday. And I was told there were going to be a press conference to talk about the ban of asbestos. And the thing that really struck me is about this brother who had worked with asbestos, who had died of asbestos, and his last dying wish for us to, of course, uh, have this ban. It is the right public policy, but for generations to come, we are still going to see there's at least 2,000 Canadians who die every year as a result of asbestos exposure from the past. And I think as soon as we clean up the workplaces and buildings across this country that has asbestos, uh, I think future generation will benefit from this policy because we're no longer importing. We're no longer, of course, obstructing, of course, in the international arena that, that asbestos be labeled as a carcinogen and we are no longer exporting asbestos as a country. So again, I feel honored that I've been part of that and I want to thank all the activists throughout the years. This was a very div divisive issue in the labor movement in the early 60s. We couldn't even get our heads around but we should ban it because our members were the one who were mining asbestos back yeah, then. Yeah. But it took us a while. We did reach a consensus. This was the right thing to do. And I thank so many of the activists and leaders who participated in that campaign and made it possible. Yeah. Um, next issue, pay equity. You know, uh, pay equity at the federal level has been something that was very daunting. And the last government took efforts to even criminalize union from helping their members achieving pay equity complaint. If the unions were to help their members, they would be fined legally and found guilty. We took on again this issue, again recognize that women's equality in this country is a far away from getting to 100%. And unless we pay them properly, they're never going to achieve economic equality in this country. Um, of course, the moment was right. Uh, the federal government wanted to work on, of course, um, bringing a proactive pay equity legislation. I want to thank a lot of the ministers who were very supportive. We worked with the broad pay equity coalition uh, that were very supportive of this, and many of the uh, our affiliates was very supportive of the campaign. But equally, we got to a point, of course, where we were able to. We didn't get everything we want 100%. But there's three jurisdictions in the country. Is Quebec have half the best pay equity legislation, Ontario now in the federal jurisdiction. We took a bit of both the Quebec and the Ontario legislation to, of course, to uh, craft the federal pay equity legislation, and it's one of the best things we've done. The regulations is just about to be published, where women will start benefiting from the pay pro proactive pay equity legislation in the federal public sector, but also in the private sector and the federal level. I hope in about 10 or 20 years from now, women will starting to see the impact of this on their paycheck, but equally saw to see the benefit of how this can improve their lives, give them better retirement benefit, but also give them a better income so they can be recognized for their true value in the work that they do on behalf of, of, of workers across this country. Um, well, what, what a long journey. Um, one more quick issue before I turn it over to, to Karen, uh, phasing out coal. Phasing out coal uh, is an easy decision because it's the right decision because we know coal uh, generation create the worst kinds of climate impact in terms of it poisons the water, the, it's pollution, it creates sickness in young people, especially if they have asthma. Of course, the air is, uh, is, is bad as a result of it. 
And the decision was made to phase out coal as part of our global commitment around how we're going to meet our climate change objective. The, the time frame they set was 2030. I was asked to co-chair a task force for the federal government on the phase out of coal. And I think the achievement there was to talk to the workers who are going to be impacted and the communities that was going to be impacted and how we could put forward a better public policy to ensure those workers and community were not going to be left behind. The recommendations are far reaching. Some of them, of course, are in progress of being achieved. But at the end of the day, uh, I think um, it was the right decision for our government. We supported the decision as a labor movement. A lot of our members work in the coal excavation yeah. in the mine, but also they work in the coal generating um, uh, facility. Uh, it's unionized uh, uh, plant. And of course, we support it because we know it's the right public policy now. What we have to work towards is a just transition legislation that will lay out the rights of workers in the context of transition, but equally, how do we invest in those communities likely to lose these good jobs and have those jobs replaced with other jobs, provide workers with training and transition measures for those who wants to retire, and of course, those who wants to move to other communities where they can take their skills and improve their skills to uh, get future jobs. We need to support those workers to ensure that they have the best outcome at the end of the day because they should not pay the penalty because we made the decision. But it was, it is the right decision. We support the decision as a labor movement. Yeah. And again, I was honored to, of course, co-chair the task force uh, on the phase out of coal. Well, thank you for your work on all of those, uh, Hassan. I wish we had more time to discuss them in detail. And I hope there will be more study of this, of, of, of the way you've done successful campaigns because it's very instructive for all sorts of things in the future. I want to turn to uh, Karen to uh, take you to some other issues. Thank you, Andrew. Well, Hassan, it really is good to see you. And we've been on the same side of so many issues all these years. I wonder if you want to comment on some of the changes that we're seeing now and that have been announced in child care, seniors care, pharma care, I mean, what we might call the social safety net and and how these issues have impacted differently on different parts of our population and the commitment to counter the systemic discrimination in those areas. Well, let me start with the child care announcement. I think this is an incredible, uh, Karen, it's good to see you first. Uh, I should acknowledge that uh, reality. Uh, you're a great friend and I want to thank you for the work we've done in the past on so many files and, and the collaboration. But um, Childcare is one of those incredible public policy that going to benefit this country for generations to come. Of course, we now have to work to make sure the federal government and the province reach agreement to ensure what they have laid out in the budget becomes a reality. It will be really a disservice to families and more specifically to women if this does not, does not happen. It really be a denial of the lack of equality that families and women struggle with in this country. Uh, child care is something, of course, is going to, and early learning is going to be incredibly um, important for the future of our country. I'm fortunate. Uh, I have a, my daughter is no longer needing child care, but I remember the time when we did have a child, um, how much it impacted in both of our lives, and, and we had to find other ways. We had the resources to hire somebody to help her. us. But we know for a lot of families, that's not even the reality, much less getting access to childcare spaces. So this is going to make a huge difference. It's also going to women, allow women's participation in the workforce in a greater numbers. They will, of course, be contributing to the national treasures, both at the national, at the federal level, but also the provincial level, but also for the children who will benefit from early learning and childcare, it will give them certainly a secure future. We know from the evidence from Quebec that Children, the outcome for children is far better. We know the outcome for families and especially for women is far better. The highest participation in the workforce is in Quebec because they have a national childcare program. The Quebec program, childcare program has evolved to where it's at today. And I assume the national program that our federal government is about to roll out with the provinces will also evolve based on the reality of provincial experience. And of course, more importantly, you know, we have BC who are committed to working with the federal government. They want to, of course, uh, partner with the federal government. We're going to also have to get out of province. Newfoundland is equally committed to working with the federal government. But we're going to have to roll up our sleeve and bring the other province to the table to make sure they participate. This is a great victory for, for women. It's a great victory for families. And it's a great victory ever since I can remember in the Canadian Labour Congress, we've had a campaign 
for national child care policy. I can't tell you how honored I am, how pleased I am to see happen, this happen for our country. And I want to thank the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, but also want to thank Ahmed Hussein, the minister who responded for the file, and of course the government for actually biting the bullet and doing the right thing. Yes, it's going to cost lots of money, but every penny of that money will go right back in the economy to grow the economy and of course to ensure our future children will have a bright future. And I can't think of a better thing that we can do at this time in the pandemic, given the devastation women have faced, of course, in, in, in this economy. Long-term care is something that really troubles me. We have been uh, warehousing our seniors for far too long, whatever appreciating the context in which that warehousing has been happening. We don't think about how they're treated. We don't think in the conditions in which they are living in. And more importantly, the workers who are performing the service to take care of them, we've, they're out of sight. What the pandemic has revealed is simply unacceptable for this to continue. We need to have some national standards so we can hold province accountable. How do we pay workers who are doing this job? How do we train workers who are doing this job? How do we ensure that the seniors actually have a minimum amount of care so they should get the care that they deserve so they can have a bath every day or a shower every day? They can actually make sure they're in modern facilities. They're not four housed in a room. So when one is sick, everybody gets sick into that room, which we learned in the pandemic. And far too many have died. Of course, we know there are some commissions in certain jurisdictions looking at this issue. We have made it very clear. We think uh, long-term care should be brought in under the Health Care Act and become, of course, one of those issues regulated by the federal government and the provincial government at the same time. But equally, we need to ensure the workers who are providing the care for our seniors in this country are people that they actually pay attention to and make sure we're paying them right. If they're not paid right, if they don't have paid sick leave and the ability to take care of themselves, how are they going to take care of our seniors? And the last point I want to make, the seniors of this country is the people who help build this great nation of ours. They are the ones who help create this country the way it is today. We owe them a debt of gratitude and we need to do everything to ensure both the federal government but also the provincial government work together to establish some standards so we can hold them accountable so we will never see the kind of devastation and the debts we saw happen during the pandemic ever happen again to our seniors in this country. You've certainly been at the forefront of this for so many years, Hassan. Uh, seven years as president of the Canadian Labour Congress and many years before that as secretary treasurer and it's played such an important role and you've played such an important role over these years. But ha have you seen the labour movement change over that time? And if so, how? Well, um, you know, the, the labor movement is constantly changing um, because there's agitation. When I was a young activist in my own union, I, I would describe myself as a shit disturber. I didn't really <laughs> care what the leadership, you know, whether they liked me or not because I was pushing the envelope. I think that same kind of attitude still exists today with newer activists, younger activists. The, of course, the challenges that we're faced with now is the world is moving at a much faster pace. The labor movement has never been more diverse in its history because the country is more diverse today. The labor movement ranks is predominantly women today. Uh, women make up over half the membership of our movement, more than half the membership of our movement. And I think in that reality, you're seeing things taking place in the movement policy that we're supporting and advancing that are playing a much, much prominent role in the, the priorities of the labor movement. You know, long-term care is one of those. Uh, child care is, a, we took on an issues like, you know, domestic violence as a labor movement, recognizing that what we wanted until we ended, people face domestic violence. Far 99% of the population is women who face domestic violence. And we decided that this is something we need to take on because not only because of our women membership, because this is a principal issue for us to fight on. We launched a campaign to say we need to ensure that women could get time off from their job if they need it, if they're faced with domestic violence. And in some jurisdictions, there's over five paid days for domestic violence leave. It's in the collective agreement of our, of our, of our affiliate organization education, how we can change attitudes. It is, this is men's behavior that we have to change, but at the same time, we have a responsibility to lead, to show government you've got a role to play. This is a societal problem. And until we fix this problem in a societal way, we also have responsibility to do things that are going to make people's lives 
who have been faced with this violence a bit better and more predominantly. So the movement is changing. It certainly needs to change faster, as some will say, and I would say to some degree. And that, of course, you need to reflect the diversity of its members. There's no question the labor movement cannot be all white and all male any, anymore. It does not reflect the reality of this particular period we're living in. And I think our leadership and our affiliate organization are very conscious of that. They're all struggling with it and figuring out how they're going to do. But the big challenge we face in the labor movement, how do we increase our density given the change we're dealing with, the kind of work that are happening? And more importantly, how do we unionize these workers that is now uh, uh, labeled precarious workers uh, working in precarious conditions, how do we bring them into the labor movement? This remains, I think, a fundamental challenge for us as a labor movement at this particular juncture in our history. Now, our density has remained fairly stable, but that does not mean we should get complacent or be smug. We've got a long way to go to grow our density and to improve it, but the reality is we got to do a better job of how we outreach to those communities that don't see the labor movement as part of their 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 norm. Why would they join a union if they don't see themselves reflected? Why would they commit to being part of the labor movement if we don't think that we're addressing their issue? And I think all of the issues that ethnic communities face, that women face, that First Nation community face, are part of the issue we need to fight on. We need to stand in solidarity with, and those issues are should be our issue. They're not separated from us. As much as we care about the economic conditions, in which workers are going to work. We all should care about the social conditions in which they live in, in our society. And we need to combine those two things as the foundation of our movement. Do you, do you think that uh, the pandemic has given you the opportunity to make a stronger case for unionization because of the differ differential impact on the different populations and the kind of security that can come with unionization? I think we, I certainly uh, wrote an op-ed piece that spoke specifically to that, that this is a moment that if we truly want to deal with the cracks that has been revealed in the pandemic, is for us to, of course, and governments to change the legislation that restrict workers from joining union to allow them to do so if they chose to do so. And I think what workers are experiencing in far too many cases we're seeing during the pandemic, lacking of sick pay, who's advocating for them, lacking of support during the pandemic, how do you, they didn't, the CERB didn't come out of thin air. We had to advocate. How do we support those workers? How do we get a wage subsidy that will help keep workers on payroll? How do we ensure that the employers are going to deal with the issue of safety in the workplace to protect workers, even though we're still seeing workers infected and are, more importantly are dying as a result of the pandemic? By having a union, I think you have a better shot of having a voice in the workplace, and you certainly have a better chance of getting a better decent pay as a result of that. One of our efforts in this most recent budget, we've been advocating for the federal government to establish a federal minimum wage. Finally, we have a $15 federal minimum wage in the federal jurisdiction. It's going to make a huge difference to workers who work in the federal jurisdiction at airports and other places, but equally, hopefully, it will raise the standards at a provincial level to say, if you're not already paying a $15 minimum wage at a provincial level, you need to get to that. And then we need to continue to increase to where we get to a living wage in this country. But fundamentally, I think we recognize our job is not simply to advocate for our members, it's to advocate for all workers in this country, because we want to uplift the conditions for everybody, not just for the members who belong to the Canadian Labor Congress. Well, Hassan, you, you've, you've done some absolutely amazing work over the years. Have you seen the political or policy climate change over time? I mean, it seems that uh, labor movement could have appeared to be more adversarial in the past, but is it a fair assessment to say that now there's a little bit more cooperation with government or you can kind of change things by working more inclusively and collegially with government. Have you seen a, a policy and political climate change? Well, I think certainly at the federal level uh, with, with, of course, um, uh, the prime minister, when he first got elected, uh, we invite him, I think it was six days after his election, to come to speak to one of our Canadian council meeting and to everybody's surprise, he accepted the invitation and, and came <laughs> and speak to people. And he actually acknowledged, you know, that, hey, 
Yes, um, there's many things we have to do and, and we have to work. And I know that not all of you didn't, some of you didn't vote for me or didn't uh, consider uh, me as uh, your, uh, your 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 opinion, but he did extend one important um, uh, 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 value, which he said, "Hey, I want to work with you in a collaborative manner uh, going forward." And that's uh, since the election in 2015, and we've been on that journey together. I don't, we don't agree on everything. I can say that for certain. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our differences, and we argue about them, and we debate each other, and we even criticize each other publicly about that. But the reality, they have been certainly a recognition that working people and their organization deserve to be respected and to be heard and to be understood and to be taken seriously if you're going to construct legislation to help working people advance um, their their um, their interests in society. And I, I, I have to say, I've been fortunate to be part of that um, effort. And, you know, I, I, you know, I don't get everything I want when I talk to government, but I know I have to keep engaging. I have to build a relationship and continue to make the argument. But I also say that to government at the provincial level. I don't have to love you because uh, I don't think your political stripe may be my most um, uh, there to. But the reality, um, you know, we, we still have to find a way to communicate and to connect and to talk to government. And we have been doing our best. Of course, there's still some who believe they don't have to talk to the labor movement or engage in the labor movement. But I do know one thing. We haven't gone anywhere in 65 years since the creative organization. We're not about to go anywhere soon. And anybody who have any understanding, thinking we're about to leave the stage, I may be leaving very shortly. But the reality is the Congress will remain strong and committed. And I think the work that I have been fortunate to be part of didn't just happen with me. It happened with a lot of activists and leadership and our affiliates supporting that work recognizing we're making progress on behalf of working people and we need to build on the relationship that 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 you have established and more importantly that you have created for us to uh, benefit from in regard to what we're doing on behalf of working people in this country well wherever you go Hassan I, we wish you well and you're going to make a difference no matter where you go you've already made a huge difference and uh, the labor movement and indeed all of Canada owes you a debt of gratitude I need to turn it over to Andrew now to uh, to wrap up this part of our session, but it's been a delight to see you again. Thank you, Karen. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Hassan, for your for, for joining us today. This is a very busy time for you and uh, a busy time for your international work as well, but we really appreciate your taking uh, a half hour to, to join us. Any thoughts or any hints you can give us about what you'll be doing next? Um, no, but whatever I do next, I want to ensure that is something of value, uh, that is, of course, I'm going to get a lot of enjoyment uh, doing it. And more importantly, I truly love our country. I've been fortunate to see it from coast to coast. And I've been in many parts that most Canadians don't have the luxury of getting to see. It is such a wonderful country with such a magnificent people. Yeah. I think all of us need to roll up our sleeve as how do we continue to make this country an even better place than it is today. And I'm hoping whatever I do, I can contribute in that way. Uh, I still will be fulfilled. If I don't do anything, I'm, I'm happy to enjoy my retirement, uh, reading about the great work others like you and others will be doing, uh, Andrew. And thank you, Garen, very kindly for having me today on, on the Pearson Center. Well, thank you. And I hope we'll, we'll be able to have you back and involved in some of the work we do. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. We'll be, we'll be, uh, Anim, Anime Paul will be joining us uh, shortly. So um, before that, I just want to say thank you, Hassan, and um, look forward to staying in touch. And thank you for all you've done for Canada. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. All the best. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> thank you. Hello, Anime Paul. I think you're on I mute. Muted. I was muted. Hello, how are you? Good to see you again. <laughs> Hello, Karen. Hi, Anime. Great to see you. You as well. You as well. So, Karen will get us started. Great. Well, I, I, I have the real honor of giving a quick introduction for you because we don't have too much time together and we're delighted that you would take time from your busy schedule. Um, Anamia, it's been uh, almost a year now, 2020, that you were 
chosen as leader Six of months. the Green Pardon? Six months. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I guess this I, I have a very difficult um time with the time elements in the year 2020, which was the yeah. weirdest year that all of us have ever spent. Yeah. But um, Anami uh, is, a, is a lawyer, a very accomplished lawyer to the master's level, and she's worked in civic engagement and international affairs. I know you best as the founding uh, executive director of the and executive director of the Canadian Center of Political Leadership. And me, when I met you many, many years ago, I think it's almost 20 years ago now, I knew you would be turning the world upside down and making a huge difference in this country. Uh, you've also been in Canada's mission in the European Union. You were there for quite some time, and even in the prosecutor's office, in the International Criminal Court. Uh, we're so lucky to have you here today and taking the kind of time in, in what must be a completely over-the-top busy schedule. Uh, it's a thrill to see you, and I'm going to turn it over to um, Andrew to start things off, and then I'll come back in a few minutes. Perfect. So, Thanks so much, Karen. And be Paul, thank you so much for joining us. And I have to point out that uh, we, we did a webinar with you uh, a few months ago in the fall. And at the end of it, you, you committed to come back. And I'm happy to acknowledge that you are one of those politicians who keeps your promises. So thanks for coming back. Uh, same location. The plants are a bit, uh, have grown since then. Yeah. Uh, and, but, we're, but we're glad you're the same place uh, in a different time. Uh, look, I, I, I want to ask you, um, start off with the, with one of the big issues of this week is the budget. Um, if you give us a sense of, of your thoughts of the budget and some reflection about the uh, the care policies, seniors care, child care, pharma care, and basic income, uh, what are your thoughts around those issues? Well, maybe just to split those things up because yeah. a number of the, the topics that you mentioned weren't in fact included in the budget. Yeah. Um, we, we, we perhaps didn't expect, or I, I should say, perhaps the government didn't expect to be presenting their first budget in two years um, within the, the worst wave of the pandemic that we've seen so far. Um, but uh, nevertheless, that's the case. And so it really is the, the patina that colors the in, entire budget. And really, at least for me, uh, makes it very clear where the focus of all members of parliament and, and uh, our party should be which is on the parts of the budget that are focused on getting people relief right now in real time, uh, those who still uh, don't have the kind of support that they need. So the things that, um, that we were most interested in, uh, in terms of the budget uh, that we were listening for were things like extension of the recovery benefits. Um, we were looking to see whether new ben benefits would be introduced for people who are struggling uh, with rental arrears. Uh, we were looking uh, to uh, make sure that students were going to receive support this summer. Uh, those were really the things that we were focused on because I think however long this parliament lasts, we can at least deliver those things on behalf of people in Canada. Right. Uh, I, can, I can answer the second part now or I can wait for a more detailed question. Okay, no, that. sorry. So, so, so let me then ask you about um, um, childcare. Okay, and sorry, first I wanted to acknowledge that I'm here in Toronto on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Odnashone, and the Huron-Wendat, um, which I say with a great deal of gratitude. Uh, in terms of childcare, uh, you know, the, the, I think first I have to address, or at least I want to address the elephant in the room, which is that will this session of Parliament last long enough for this even to get underway? Uh, and unfortunately, it seems at the moment that the answer is no. Uh, I, you know, as, as a party who is seeking to extend this session of parliament as long as possible, not only because of the pandemic, but because we know that historically minority parliaments have succeeded in doing remarkable things when they put their mind to it, and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we, we don't see the signs of that. We see a lot of pre-election um, posturing, a lot of sloganeering, a lot of things 
uh, suggests that we may be in an election in the next uh, three to six months, in which case it's really theoretical, I would say. Um, but what I, I, you know, childcare and any of the long-term projects, which really, uh, you know, all the work is ahead of us. But what I would say is that certainly we support that and we are ready to work with any party that wants to see universal childcare in Canada. Uh, it's long overdue. Uh, there's no question uh, that the, the points that Minister Freeland made about why it's needed and, and you know, how it's a matter of equity, but also our economy, all of those things we absolutely agree with. And so, you know, you will always find us uh, on the child, the side of childcare. And I would say that the more that we want to ensure that we get it, um, the more we need to put partisanship aside and, and try to find the common ground so that we can keep this session going. Yeah, uh, on, on your point about um, making a minority government work, I do want to uh, take a moment to recognize that tomorrow is the 58th anniversary of the Pearson government taking office uh, back in 1963. And uh, Pearson had two minority governments uh, that lasted a total of five years and did more uh, than most other governments uh, have done in a longer period of time. And, and so certainly policies such as uh, the Canada Pension Plan and Medicare, the Canadian flag and many others came during that minority government when different parties worked together. So your point is, is very apt and certainly one at the Pearson Center, we, we, we like to talk about. Um, uh, tell me your thoughts about um, uh, seniors care. There was a little bit in the, in the budget about uh, developing a national standards for the seniors care. Yeah, there, there was, it was very, uh, again, I, I'm trying not to, I have to say that sometimes, uh, you know, when I'm asked about the budget uh, over the last uh, week or so, I really feel like I'm um, promoting the, the Liberal platform for the next election. <laughs> exactly because, as I said, this parliament, it's not as if we're in the first year of a four-year mandate of a majority government. It's a minority parliament that is quite fragile. Um, but just with respect to, to seniors, you know, for those of us who, who lost um, uh, loved ones in long-term care during this pandemic, there is no question that uh, what is needed is urgent long-term care reform. Uh, I think, sadly, um, the jury is in that the system that we have and the, the, the responsibility solely being given to the provinces uh, to design that system has not worked that the original sin of not having um, included a long-term care in the Canada Health Act, as was recommended by the Canadian Medical Association at the time, has proven to be a, 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 a um, literally a fatal mistake. Uh, and so, you know, to not see it being addressed as the urgent uh, matter that, that it should be addressed as um, is not to me a fitting legacy, a fitting tribute to all the people who have lost their lives in, in long-term care. This is really the time for us to get together uh, intergovernmentally, provinces and federal government, to talk about how we're going to create the healthcare system of the future, um, how we're going to create the long-term care, long care system of the future, um, how we're going to allow people to age in place in their homes, uh, which is what people prefer, how we're going to increase our um, investments in community care to at least meet the OECD average. Uh, those are the kind of big, important conversations that I think really uh, reflect the scale of, of what has been lost and sacrificed uh, during this pandemic. So, you know, any any half measures, I'm not I'm not crazy about. Okay, let me switch gears and talk about the green economy and get your thoughts about what, what Canada should be doing in terms of a transition to, to a, green, a green economy, whether we approach it from a just transition uh, policy type of approach. Um, uh, give us your thoughts about what, what we should be doing the next, well, now in the next few years. Well, tomorrow is Earth Day, uh, and it's uh, every Earth Day is, is special. It's always a chance to reflect and to recommit and so this earth day next um tomorrow will be will be special as all of those in the past have been another element of what makes tomorrow special is that um, president biden is convening world leaders to talk about the climate um seeing the u.s re-engage on the climate is very very exciting it creates a tremendous amount of opportunities for the global community but certainly for canada as the united states uh, closest trading partner 
Uh, even before uh, President Biden was elected, uh, the Green Party was pushing for a green recovery. Uh, I see this and our party sees this as the chance of a lifetime uh, for us to create the economy of the future, to um, create uh, the jobs of the future, uh, also the thing that is going to pull us most quickly out of the post-pandemic economic doldrums as well and get our economy going again. Uh, and, and, you know, as importantly as all of that, um, allow Canada to finally assume a role of leadership in bending the curve on uh, our increased greenhouse gas emissions. Um, because Canada still is one of the worst polluters in the world. We, I mean, amongst uh, wealthy countries, we continue year on year to increase our greenhouse gas emissions. So what we're hoping to see in terms of the, the start of a green recovery is a new climate target being announced. And as I understand it, there will be a new one announced. We want to see 60% reductions uh, below 2005 levels by 2030. We want to hear that we're going to be pushing really hard to develop a carbon border with uh, the US so that we can keep those dirty imports out and help our own industries to grow. We want to see investments in the kind of infrastructure that supports a green economy. Um, you know, there's a whole wish list of incredibly exciting investments that we can make so that Canada can really take a competitive place and a leadership role on the climate and the green economy. Yeah, and, and what are your thoughts about, about transitioning uh, those areas of the economy which would be phased out, such as oil and gas, or, or phased down? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, provinces like uh, Alberta, you know, the prairies, Newfoundland, those who are, are um, uh, the most dependent on uh, resource uh, extraction in the fossil fuel sector, they're, they're at the front of the line to benefit from a green recovery. Um, you know, the infrastructure that you talk about, when, that you consider when uh, you, you think about renewable energy, for instance, Alberta, for instance, is one of the best places in the world uh, for geothermal energy, one of the best places uh, in Canada for solar energy. And so those jobs pay more, they're jobs where the skills of fossil fuel workers are directly transferable without expensive lengthy retraining. Uh, we know this from the from the, our exa the examples in the United States. Um, and we know for every million dollars that we invest in uh, green jobs and green sectors, we get almost eight jobs as compared to the three jobs we get for the same million in the fossil fuel sector. So for me, it's you know this is a personal thing. My my brother worked out in um, in the oil patch as a roughneck, uh, but even beyond my personal experience, this really is all about the human beings uh, whose lives will be displaced as this sector uh, continues its irreversible decline. I don't want uh, the you know I don't want uh, the Newfoundland cod fishery story to replicate itself, but this time in the oil patch. Uh, we need to diversify the economies as soon as possible in order to um, prevent that kind of displacement. So this is an, an exciting opportunity if we choose to view it that way and get started as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll turn uh, I'll turn over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Karen Mock. Thank you, Andrew. I have so much I would love to catch up with you on, <laughs> enemy. <Hi>. Um, <laughs> But, it, you know, just as climate change is, is a worldwide international issue, um, I'm seeing, you know, the kind of work that we did and that you did when you were founding the Canadian Centre of Political Leadership was to help raise the voice of marginalized communities, of women, of, of those who, who didn't have a chance to have their voice raised and heard in the interest of equity and social justice. Um, and now we're seeing, while we're still trying to do that work, that right-wing extremism is threatening democracy worldwide. Uh, recently in Canada, um, they're trying to strengthen the anti-racism directorate and they've escalated support to counter online hate. But, and we see that internationally, Canada is trying to seek a stronger role in the United Nations, but what kind of leadership do you think we need at the federal level to to emphasize our Canadian values and human rights and, and counter overt and systemic discrimination 
at home and abroad. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that's huge, but it I would is. love to hear you. <laughs> I'd love to hear you say a few words on that. Certainly, certainly. and it, it is huge, but I'll, I'll try to, you know, take it bite size. Um, let's say domestically first. Um, my reflection about uh, the, you know, the events over the last, the course of the last year, whether it was um, uh, the assassination of, of George Floyd or whether it was the uh, insurrection on um, Capitol Hill, uh, is that we have to remember that these things can, can, you know, they can, they can sneak up on you. The warning signs can be there and they can be ignored, and uh, then these things happen. Um, and we shouldn't feel for a second that we are absolutely immune. I think that we are better inoculated for the moment uh, than the United States, but we're certainly not immune from, from, uh, from those kind of deep divisions and cleavages. Um, and so the federal government has a very important role to play. Uh, much of those kind of divisions and cleavages, their, their roots can be found in inequity. And uh, you know, the growing, growing inequities feed those kind of divisions they they give um, space and um, an audience to to extremist views, to supremacist ideologies, um, and so we have to be really vigilant. And in the case of Canada, even prior to the pandemic, we saw that there was rising inequality. We saw rising intergenerational um, inequality. We saw greater inequality between the sexes, between regions, and so on. And this is only being exacerbated by the pandemic. And so one of the most important roles that government has to play right now and the federal government can play is really identifying, doing a a thorough audit of of where these inequities lie uh, and systematically working at dismantling them and addressing them. It, It really has to be a holistic approach because we see, and we've seen, if you plug a hole here, but you don't address the other one, then um, then it doesn't work or there's an unintended consequence. And so this is why it's so important for us to be talking about things like a guaranteed livable income, uh, about uh, universal childcare, universal post-secondary education, universal pharmacare. Um, these are investments that we have historically understood, um, coming back to the Pearson years, we have historically understood that these investments pay off they not only pay off in terms of our economy and our productivity, um, but they also pay off in terms of our social cohesion, um, which has a value. Yes, it has even an economic value, but it really has a value all in its own in creating the kind of society we all, we will all want to live in. So all of those things are, are you know, they're, the, they're not the exclusive um, purview of the federal government, but certainly the federal government has a role to play. Um, and then globally, it's the same, you know, globally, uh, we we know that uh, development and our progress to ro- towards the sustainable development goals has been tremendously set back because of the pandemic. Uh, we know that women in particular have lost many years of, of progress towards development and that if we don't move quickly, it's going to become entrenched, it's going to become structural. And so Canada needs to do its part to um, to support development abroad because we know that the lack of development Creates, um, you know, frag- creates fragility in societies and in social cohesion. So we should be respecting our overseas development assistance commitments. We we have not done that as far as I know ever, and I didn't see anything much about that in the budget. Um, we should not be taking doses from Covax because that is one of the greatest threats to development right now. Uh, the lack of vaccination in low-income countries. Uh, you know, we should be looking for opportunities to to show leadership and to be as generous as we can be with our, our international neighbors right now. That was a long answer, but it was a heavy question. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to share with us, uh, you know, while you have the, the platform, things that, you know, how organizations like the Pearson Center for Progressive Policy can encourage more progressive policy in all the areas that that you and I, I will say, hold dear? Mm -hmm. Well, first, just to say in the spirit of Pearson uh, that uh, anything that you can do to encourage a a return to a greater amount of cooperation and collaboration between parties and levels of government is certainly very welcome. 
you know, I, I don't think it's just strictly nostalgia, <clears throat> excuse me, to miss the, the, you know, the days, those, those halcyon days, those historic days where we were able to come together across party lines to create things like CPP, uh, like Medicare, uh, et cetera. You know, this, we, we need that spirit right now exactly because we have so much work to do, um, both in terms of the challenges, but also the opportunities. You know, this is a time that really could be uh, a uh, just a just a, a once in a generation kind of uh, moment for people in Canada, uh, and that's certainly something I would love to be a part of. But it really is going to take more cooperation uh, than we're seeing now. So anything you can do in that regard uh, to bring back that spirit uh, is very very welcome. You know, Pearson believes in multilateralism. I think if we take that down to the domestic level. Um, you know, we, we need that again, we need that understanding that we're stronger together. So yes, and, and just, just to say that as difficult as this period has been, and it has been one of the most difficult in our history, there is so much hope and inspiration that we can take from the way that people in Canada responded in just very everyday ways. And what it tells me is that they believe in each other, that they want us to be ambitious about how we take care of each other. Um, and, and if we can tap into that and if we, can, if we can direct it, I think that we could really finally complete our social safety net. I think we could um, imagine a future where every person in Canada can live in dignity throughout their lives and also where we have a, a livable planet um, and that we were part of that, that we were part of the generation of Canadians that made that happen. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I certainly wish you strength in, in carrying on and, and realizing your vision. I'm going to turn it back to Andrew now for some last words. All the best, Annemie. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. And thank you so much for your leadership and, and your work as well. It's, uh, you know, you are you already. I mean, I don't think you have to do one more single thing in life. You've already <laughs> earned earned your place in the history books of this country. So thank you so much for everything that you have done and will continue to do. No, no, thank no, you. Let me say that to our board members. We need we need Karen to be doing to carry on doing a lot of great stuff with us. Um, and the one last thing, and the one last thing is to make sure that it's the next generation that takes it over. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Anime Paul, if I can just take uh, uh, the last discussion one one step further and ask mm -hmm. your thoughts about world affairs. You've you've worked in Europe with international mm -hmm. organizations. What's your feeling about the world uh, today with the Biden administration? Do you think we're in a better place? Um, we've got as you know, conference coming up tomorrow uh, on climate. What, what are your thoughts about world affairs going forward in the next few years? It's always a good thing when uh, the United States decides to be an engaged uh, global partner. And there's no question that uh, that precious time was lost uh, during the years when when we didn't have that. Uh, that that being said, you know, Canada and other countries, uh, if there are any silver linings, one of them I would say is that um, the global the global community or the people that Canada traditionally um, uh, considers itself to be an ally of, uh, found ways to work around that, uh, found ways to still continue to make progress. And I think that's something we should always keep in mind, that uh, the United States is a, a, an important power in the world, it's a superpower, uh, but other countries collectively can still uh, get you know, progress on, on actions that are important. So having President Biden show leadership on files like the climate, having him show uh, leadership on day one on things like racial uh, injustice and systemic discrimination, uh, those things absolutely will always resonate uh, beyond the borders of the United States. Um, so that's very encouraging. You know, I will say that for me, uh, during during the last uh, during the previous administration, I continued to pivot. Um, towards the EU. Uh, it's somewhere that I worked and lived uh, for a number of years. And it's right. so exciting to see what's going on. You may have noticed that uh, the European Union, uh, just today, uh, the member states and the parliament adopted a binding target of 55% of reductions in greenhouse gases below uh, 1990 levels. 
never mind 2005. Uh, and so, and then the United Kingdom announced uh, la earlier this week that they were going to be reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by 78% below 2000, sorry, below 1990 levels by 2030. So when I'm looking for ambition and inspiration about how people, how countries can work uh, multilaterally, cooperatively on big issues, on, on, on things that they have, you know, that don't have a precedent, uh, I tend to look there, uh, and it gives me optimism about multilateralism. And in the case of Canada, certainly, when multilateralism and multilateral institutions are working well, um, it's always good for us. It gives us a bigger voice. It gives us um, more of a say. Uh, it allows us to punch above our weight, as we like to say. So, you know, I think that this could be a very special moment, but it will require ambition. It will require... Um, an ability to see beyond uh, what we have done before. And I think that, uh, you know, I think Canadians are up for it. And now we just have to see if uh, our political class is up for it as well. well. Well, yeah, really, thank you so much. And thank you for ending on a Pearsonian note. We always yeah. love to have that, uh, not just part of the discussion, but to end on that, on that note too. Uh, before I say goodbye, I just want to tell our audience that we've got uh, two more sessions in this three-week conference. Um, tomorrow, Thursday at 11 a.m., we have a session on understanding the budget with Associate Finance Minister Mona Fortier. And on Friday at 3 p.m., we have a session on Canadian culture and broadcasting with the Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Guibault. Uh, so with that, I want to say uh, thank you to Anami Paul. I'm going to ask you once again, will you come back and join us? <laughs> with pleasure. And that's a very, very good strategy, I must say. It's on film, it's recorded <laughs> with, with, with a great deal of pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's, it's, the questions are always very engaging. Thanks so much. Well, yeah, I've, I've got to tell you, we get very good ratings with, with, uh, with, with the webinar when you're on. People really enjoy uh, listening to the discussion that, that you bring to, uh, to the political scene. So thank you so much for your time joining us today. Thank you to your audience and join us again for the next two days. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye.